So often you see the videos and TV features where white-tailed deer are feeding or walking. But hunters spend precious little time comparatively watching deer. They spend most of their time watching where they expect deer to be or where deer have been. It's called scouting. And there's no better teacher than MSU Wildlife Extension Specialist Glenn Dutterer. He knows his deer and his deer sign. We're going to go scouting with Glenn in just a moment, so you stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. Major funding for this program is provided by Stroh. By sharing the responsibility to preserve our natural treasures, together we ensure our right to enjoy them. Stroh, partners in preserving America's outdoor heritage. What signs should hunters begin looking for to find deer? Well, the most obvious is their tracks. Old tracks, quite old. Yeah, very old. Must have been muddy because they're sunk down into the sand quite a bit. And they've lost all definition. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, but it rained last night. Oh, long. look, look yeah, right here. Right. Yeah, this is, right here. This has been made sometime between eight and nine o'clock last night and now. So this track and this, tra oh, that's a nice big track there. You notice it's it's well defined. The but rain over here, hasn't blurred. We have even some better ones. Yeah, some really good ones. Right there. So this is a fresh track because it rained last night. This we but, know a deer but, was in the area. It's several hours old because you can see where the earth has been pushed up. It's lost. Mm -hmm. There's no moisture in it. The sand is just completely dried away. But this track is fresher than this track. Oh yeah, this track was. You can see it's been blurred by the rain. So this was made before last night, mm -hmm. whereas this was, has been made since last night. But again, same here. But again, this isn't anything to get excited about because it, it tells you that the deer are here and they're coming in probably at mm -hmm. night. But uh, as far as getting too excited, you'd see tracks like this all, all over. over the place, yeah. if, if it was all well, tracks are the easiest deer sign to find. But deer leave tracks everywhere they walk, day and night. So tracks alone don't give you a big clue as to their behavior. And neither do another common sign, the droppings. But there they are. And, and like you said, they're, they're reasonably fresh because you can see they're shiny. Mm -hmm. And that mucilaginous covering uh, deteriorates very, very quickly. So when you find fresh dro or droppings like that that are still wet and shiny, particularly on a warm, windy day like that, you know they were made just a few hours ago. It helps to know if tracks and droppings are fresh. Now that tells you that the deer have been active during daylight and these aren't just night areas. But Glenn Dutterer and I wanted to find more definitive deer sign, more particularly buck sign, because that's what we're after. And we'll find it even though we're on a corner bordered by two county roads. The road doesn't bother the deer? No. Uh -uh. Okay, we got the swamp right over there. That's, that's my first hint, is I'm looking for a place that deer can go that I know hunters typically aren't going to follow. And I know that's a wet, swampy area, and hunters just don't bother it. So that's component one, a but refuge. The, the deer are obviously using that swamp now. Oh, yeah, sure. It's a good, safe place to go. It's a place to to be away from disturbance for whatever reason. Okay, now up here in the high ground, we have some, some uh, looks like some balsam or some fir trees here. Uh, these berries aren't worth anything to deer. Well, they'll nibble on them. I mean, these, nibble on the berries? Sure, these are crab apples of, of different species, and they'll nibble on that. And if not, they'll certainly nibble on the branches mm -hmm. of the apple. I mean, this is typical southern Michigan deer habitat, and it's great. The swamp. Uh, then a row of, of uh, spruce, and then here's a row of apple trees loaded mm -hmm. with apples. And then over there's a nice dense stand of young trees under that oak. Mm -hmm. So there's a place to feed and eat. But this to me looks like a big attraction to the deer right here, the, the strip of uh, scotch pines. Sure, a yeah, covered bridge, a protected travel way. They can move a long distance through this kind of habitat and be relatively undisturbed. Let's, let's go up this, here. We can, yeah, they like to bed down. Yeah, this tall this, grass this is grass. excellent bedding. And depending on which way the wind's blowing, that pine is going to give them. Okay, look at this trail here. Look at this trail here, OJ. This is... You can see where they've come from the pines, and you can see that very definitely. It's, it's come right down through here, and it leads right through here. You can, you can see in between the crab apples where the leaves are tromped down. When you stand back as you're walking, you can see this easily. Yeah, that's what you want to look for is, is the, the pattern in relation mm -hmm. to all the other things and not start concentrating on hoof prints, but, but these, these general 
Okay. Relationships. Now, patterns. buck rubs don't mean a heck of a lot to me because bucks are all over and they make rubs all over, but they're still fun to see. Yeah, well, you said it best a few years ago. A buck rub means a buck rubbed his antlers right. there. He ain't necessarily going to do it there again. Now, you're not going to find buck rubs on the pine trees. We didn't see any on the crab apples there, but on these little aspens is where I will look right up ahead yeah, here. There's an excellent example. And some old ones and some fresh ones we can point out too. Uh, a nice new one, probably done in August. Uh, here's one that's done fairly recently. The wood's just beginning to dry out. Mm -hmm. And then here's one, of course, that was done last year, maybe even the year before that. The bigger the rub, the bigger the deer generally. Well, I don't know any research to back that up. But oh, that's a, come on, everybody knows that, Glenn. <laughs> that's a wide hell opinion and I won't argue with it. Okay, hey, we'll find some, some other rubs. About all of these trees have been hit. Now, some of these are old, but look at this right here. Yeah. And, and everybody say, hey, three inch tree that high, it's gotta be a big sure. deer. And I'd argue this in favor of that. If a deer's gonna rub that high, it had to be mm -hmm. a pretty big deer to start with. Every tree that I see in here, every little sapling, even some of the big ones like this right here, have been rubbed. And right. why they tend to prefer these stands, I don't know. But typically, you know, this is where you look. And we looked here, here, this is what we found. We were looking for it. Okay, I'd say this thick stuff right here is a big attraction for oh. the deer. This Start. trail, is it because of this, this field. Sure, let's start looking for travel lanes through here, heavily used travel lanes. But this is a little secluded spot. So this is where I say, hey, there's probably scrapes in here. Mm -hmm. And that's what I tend to be more attracted to and say, this is where I'll probably hunt. So the deer can walk along here and overlook. See, the, the wind is coming up right here from the, from the lowland up the ridge here during the day. So they get a good scent of anything that's happening down there. A lot of use. Okay, right up here is a scrape. It's in the kind of area that you know, I look for for these kinds of scrapes. There's some vegetation overhead. It's uh, kind of secluded. And what would excite me, as you can see, this was done mm -hmm. last night. The soil's still loosely piled. Here's, you know, here's a footprint. Uh, you can see where he's had his hind feet and was pushing. Uh, you can see where he's clipped these branches off. And if I come back and check this again, and find the same pattern, then you know it's a mm -hmm. scrape. You, what you might do just to, to make sure that you've got an active scrape is take a, a twig, something you don't get the scent on it, and just throw some leaves or pine needles on it like that. Mm -hmm. And boy, if that's gone the next day or two, he's tending this scrape regularly. Mm -hmm. And so it's what I would call an active scrape. And I would want to be somewhere around here, but not right on it, mm -hmm. uh, a few yards off that way or that way. And this is probably the trail that he uses to come in here. Notice it's not heavily used. Mm -hmm. And what that suggests to me is this is one animal, probably a buck, coming in here, making this scrape, tending this area, you know, early in the morning, late in the evening. Well, let's follow up here and see where he would maybe go. Now look, now here's an area where deer can go through. It's only this high and it has these prickly uh, multiflora rows, but they duck right down and go scoot right underneath there. That buck likes the thick stuff. He isn't taking the easy way through. And that's typically where you find them in very thick cover, mm -hmm. not too far from a primary scrape. And they usually get into that cover before it gets light and stay there until dark. Where would Especially you where would you suppose he beds down? Right there. Right here? Mm-hmm. Somewhere rattling through this thicket is one of his major bedding areas. Bedding areas, scrapes, rubs, trails, tracks, droppings. They're all clues to the daily habits of white-tailed deer. And when you read the habitat, use natural camouflage for a blind and position yourself in a way that you're downwind from where you think the deer is likely to come, then you've got a good deer blind. Don't be afraid to move if conditions change and you'll have the best chance of at least seeing deer or maybe a buck and that makes a day in the woods all worthwhile. <laughs>
Little Bay Dinoc produces some big perch like this 14 inch, almost two pounder, taken by Larry Krause of Rapid River. Pontiac resident Paul Sachs caught this smallmouth bass that weighed over five pounds and was 21 inches long in Oakland County. Now here's what an 11 pound, 32 inch walleye looks like. Jigging in Muskegon River in Nuevo County in January was just the ticket for Roger Lowe of Bitely. 29 inches long and over nine pounds, Kim Bonner of Shelbyville had his hands full when he caught this bowfin or dogfish in Manistee Lake. Mark Millsop of Green Bay, Wisconsin called in this jumbo gobbler in Menominee County. It weighed 18 pounds and had a 10 and a quarter inch beard. Guy Ursery of Flint took this monster buck on the third day of the gun season in Genesee County. It's a 13 point buck with a 20 and a half inch spread and it was chasing a doe that was this buck's downfall. It also is the reason this buck is now venison steaks. So let's name Guy Ursery our Michigan Outdoors Trophy Deer Hunter of the Week. Shooting permits for deer causing crop damage are up this year due to the drought conditions and the high number of deer. One local biologist, though, recently refused a permit for some minimal damage to pumpkins that a farmer was raising to sell for deer bait. The Wildlife Division of DNR will be building a pheasant breeding facility at the Rose Lake Research Area. They'll be crossing Chinese Sichuan pheasants with wild trapped ringnecks as part of the pheasant restoration effort. And Fish Chief John Robertson is convening his task force on Lake Michigan to review documents and surveys on the salmon bust that's occurred there over the last couple of years. They hope to come up with some answers in mid-October. Anglers of the Asable have filed a suit to get the National Guard to release information they say may show the Guard's activities to be hurting the Asable River. The Natural Resources Commission is expected to okay a plan this week for a spring turkey hunt in the Waterloo Recreation Area. Now that's historic because it's the first hunt in southern Michigan in modern times for wild trapped and transplanted turkeys. There's some exciting news coming out of the state capitol. For the first time in a formal way, a committee has been formed to deal with hunting and fishing bills relating to the disabled or handicapped. Now, technically, it's a subcommittee of the House Committee on Conservation and the Environment, but nevertheless, its responsibility will be to act on legislation and give disabled hunters and fishermen a place to go to suggest ideas on licenses, accessibility, seasons, and equipment. Representative Tom Scott of Burton, chairman of the committee, says he originated the idea in response to the programs and the goals of Outdoors Forever. He's named Bill Brown, a state representative from Macomb County, who is a disabled sportsman due to diabetes and arthritis, to chair the subcommittee. Representative Brown says he'll be consulting with Outdoors Forever to help him with his new responsibility. You know, although it always seems to take a while for government to react to citizens' concerns, now, thanks to Representatives Tom Scott and Bill Brown, handicapped sportsmen and women will have a voice in the legislature, sooner than anyone would have ever thought it would happen. No subject is more confusing than gun laws, and we get a lot of questions, like one from Mark Mangles from Muskegon, who asks, I took two shotguns into the woods one afternoon, a 410 and a 12 gauge. Was I wrong to do so? Well, no, Mark, you were in the clear unless you were hunting for waterfowl or other migratory birds. The law says that even if you're hunting from a blind, a migratory waterfowl hunter cannot be in possession of two guns at once even if one is in a case and unloaded. Furthermore, your one waterfowl gun may not be capable of holding more than three shells. Now, if you're hunting for deer or upland game, you can take more than one gun. Just make sure that you can handle them safely. There's a handgun metallic silhouette shoot all weekend at the North Oakland Sportsman's Club at Oxford. The Saginaw Bay Walleye Club will be hosting its second annual two-person walleye tournament on Saturday and Sunday on the Saginaw and Titabawasi Rivers. Now here's an opportunity for the youngsters to get out hunting. The Shiawassee National Waterfall Refuge near Saginaw is offering a youth-only goose hunt that's for youngsters 12 to 17 years old. The hunt will take place on Saturday and Sunday. Only one adult supervisor will be permitted at each hunting blind and adults may not hunt or carry firearms. The goose hunting ought to be terrific. 
On Saturday at Fred Trost Hunting and Fishing Museum, nationally known and award-winning artist Beth Ward Donahue will exhibit her fabulous paintings of famous fishing flies. Since she started painting, Beth has painted flies from all over the world. It's an excellent chance, too, to pick up some early Christmas presents for your favorite fly fisherman. Also on Saturday and Sunday, we'll be running waterfall hunting video classics of both duck and goose hunting at Fred Trost Hunting and Fishing Museum, located on Old 27, one block north of the State Police Post and right next to Coyle's Restaurant at Houghton Lake. If you missed a number, you can get it by calling the Michigan Travel Bureau toll-free on Friday during working hours. So handguns. I, uh, I think I am going to go handgun hunting for deer. I mean, am I taking a, a real shot in the dark, so to speak, on that? Not really, because handgun hunting is, is really growing uh, across the United States. and uh, it's Well, it may grow, but how will I be able to do deer hunting? I well, mean, you, you do real well with uh, some instructions and understanding the gun and uh, taking reasonable shots, you do real well. You're talking about me giving up a rifle Well, that I can rest on a branch and... Well, you can, you can rest that gun, too, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I think once you do hunt with it and you connect with a deer, uh, I don't think you'll be using the rifle anymore. <laughs> I've learned a lot from Larry Kelly about handguns and shooting handguns, but the most important thing to remember if you want to be accurate in handgunning is to squeeze the trigger. It's basic, but the most important aspect of all shooting skills. Now watch the squeeze. Dry snapping modern handguns doesn't hurt the firing pin at all, and this really is the best way to practice, believe it or not. See me squeeze the trigger? The reason for a slow, steady squeeze is so you can hold the barrel steady. If the barrel moves just a smidgen before you fire, you miss. Now that was perfect. Now let's look through the hunting scope at this hanging metallic silhouette. My eye can't be behind the scope while the camera's looking through it, so O.J. gives me some instructions in the background. But watch. When I snap, watch the crosshairs. They stay on the target. Now, that's a good squeeze, and I'd make a hit. But here's what affects accuracy, though. A loaded gun. That big 44 Magnum barks and kicks and very often causes a flinch in shooters after just a couple of shots. The kick on a short-barreled 44 is substantial, and it intimidates shooters. Now watch this shot in slow motion. Watch how high the muzzle jumps with the big bore handgun. That's what affects the slow, steady trigger squeeze more than anything. So I now have a round loaded, and watch how my finger wiggles while I'm squeezing. Watch it wiggles right there. See that? That was a flinch. I would have missed. Now let's take a look through the scope here with the live round in the chamber. Now, I'm not at all as steady as I was when I knew the gun was empty. Again, just before I fire, I jiggle the barrel off the target. No wonder I missed. In the last second, when I was bracing myself for the recoil, I pushed the barrel down. Now, you can see in the slow motion replay that at the point the bullet was fired, I was off the target, right there, low way low. That's the effect of recoil and flinching, even if it's slight. Now look how steady I was with the dry snap. Look at that. Right on, before, after, during the squeeze, those crosshairs stayed right on the target. That's the key to accuracy. But we're only really concerned about where the barrel is pointing at the point that the bullet goes off. Got it. I'll be darned. See that? I hit the target. Now, I, I hit because during my flinch, I pulled the barrel up. Watch. Now, here's a case where an uncontrolled flinch put the sights back on the lower outside corner just at the time the hammer fell. Right there. I just caught the lower corner. Squeeze the trigger. That's the key to successful handgun hunting in Michigan outdoors. <laughs> How did the freshwater fish, the drum, get its name? 
The freshwater drum can make a drumming noise with its swim bladder. The drumming noise can be heard as the drum feed near the surface on calm evenings. Great. I'm pleased. <laughs> Mary Keskine from Johannesburg sent us a recipe which she calls Partridge Surprise. Kathy Beitler, what's so surprising about this? It's so simple. It is very, very simple, and there you got the exact kind of partridge you want. It's cleaned well and doesn't have any fat on it. And you got chicken with rice soup, frying magic, and of course oil. And you're going to stick the pieces of partridge in the frying magic. Now you could use flour here because basically that's what this is. It's flour and cornmeal and all oh, salt and pepper and some spices. And then you want to coat the pieces real good because you're just that, gonna... That is, is grouse? That is grouse. Very good Plucked grouse. grouse. Yes. And nice big pieces. And a lot of people are getting limits this time of year so it's time to get mm -hmm. it. And then you want to fry these until they're good and crispy. And then you're going to add half and half and you could drain your grease here if you're kind of watching your cholesterol intake. And you're going to let it just bubble. You don't want it hmm. to... You Boy, I bet lots of people could use this with chicken and just oh, really Oh, chicken love it. or turkey would be great. And I think that's what the surprise is, is the rice is right in all the one can of soup here. And then the onions, you don't add those, saute those or anything beforehand. Anytime you can take a game bird, which are notoriously dry, except for certain ducks and all that, and make it make it taste good, make it make it nice and moist, and make a, you know, just make it this way. <laughs> it's simple, it's yeah. great. It's great. And, and a simple recipe, too. This stuff is fantastic. The recipes with soup mm -hmm. are, are popular and they're easy, and some chefs say that that's a shortcut. It ought to be illegal, you know, with the soup. But I think it's hard to beat. Oh, it is a shortcut. We've, we've never had one, though, that you've cooked in half and half or, or cooked in milk. First. Oh, well, boy, that's The is soup good. is added later. You know, I don't know why chefs would say that, because they like to add creams and sauces and stuff to dishes, and this is just a shortcut way to do it, and it's perfect. Comes on one little can, and it's great. I think it's, um, it, with chicken, it might even, well, it wouldn't be too bland. It would be oh, good. Oh, no, it'd be great. It'd this be would great. be perfect for chicken. Chicken or turkey? Oh. Hey, good stuff. <laughs> If you didn't get all the ingredients written down from tonight's recipe, don't despair. We have it in the September-October issue of the Outdoor Digest magazine. If you're not a subscriber, we'll send you this issue free of charge. It also contains hunting and fishing articles, including one by John Trout on trailing white-tailed deer. Some great methods. Rules and a trophy book entry form for the 1988 Stroh's Hunting and Fishing Awards. A page on each week's show, including the recipes and the Outdoors Forever supplementer in each issue. All you have to do is write to me at Fred Trost's Outdoors Club, P.O. Box 1775, East Lansing, Michigan, 48826. We'll send you the September-October issue with information on how to join the club. So write to us right away. If you want to see some beautiful fall color this weekend, inland in the northern part of the lower peninsula is where it is peaking. Around the lake, we have the lake effect and it's still mostly green as it is in the south and the upper peninsula. 60% gone around Manuskong Bay on the west side, mostly gone. It is past the peak. Now that is good news for grouse and woodcock hunters and deer hunters as well. We do have flights of woodcock that have just moved in along Lake Superior. Uh, a few grouse in the Keweenaw, but limits of grouse, the best season in about seven years throughout the upper peninsula. Woodcock limits around Rogers City. The reason for the low grouse take in the northern lower is the leaves on the trees. As far as ducks and geese go, well, the duck season that's going to be opening in the northern lower, uh, lots of local ducks around, but not much word in many areas. In the Upper Peninsula, the big story has been geese. Limits of geese in the western UP, and the flight geese, by the way, are in. When we take a look at our fishing report, walleye. Well, we're not getting a lot of walleye in most parts of the state. Uh, a couple of them, one to two pounds in Manuskong Bay, two to three in the three to four pound range in Lake Gogebic. We get a look at Bay Danak. A couple walleye, but they're running seven to eight pounds. Not much word from our sources in Saginaw Bay, but our guides tell us down around Trenton that they're getting some big ones down in the southeast, uh, two to five pounders and limit catches. 
perch. Well, we're getting 40 to 50 perch, 7 to 11 inches uh, down in the Breast Bay area. On the west side of the state, it's been rough and windy. They're having uh, limits of 8 to 11 inches taken in the Bay de Noc, uh, 60 to 80, 9 inches taken in Saginaw Bay, and a couple anglers can usually get 50 or 60 in um, Manuskong Bay running up to 13 inches. And finally, here we are to our salmon report. Once again, a disappointment. If you catch one to three, you're about average. I mean, that's a good catch. They are getting limits in the rivers in various parts of the state where the salmon have come up. Emil Dean talked to the DNR. The DNR said they expected 10,000 to return to the weir, and they only had about 2,000 come in. It's been windy, kind of rough. Salmon has been disappointing, but there's lots of good hunting and fishing and local fall color to see, so get outdoors this weekend. It's a great place to be. See you next week. Michigan Outdoors was funded in part. Major funding for this program was provided by Stro. By joining together as partners to preserve our natural treasures, together we ensure our right to enjoy them. Stro, partners in preserving America's outdoor heritage. Next week on Michigan Outdoors, we're going woodcock hunting in the northeast corner of the Lower Peninsula, a beautiful area that's full of deer, turkeys, and upland game. Our recipe for butterfly duck breast has been given a top rating by Bob Garner. <laughs> Some surprise, but it's an excellent way to fix game birds. And the guide report will bring you up to date on waterfowl flights, fishing conditions, and the leaf drop. So join me for all this and a lot more next Thursday night right here on PBS. <laughs>